what specifically was so different to you about James Brown than all the other music that you were hearing and listening to? Um, Give It Up, Turn It Loose, Sex Machine. That was like highlight of the of the day records. Funky drama. Yeah. Those was like highlight of the night records or highlight of the day records. Like when you throw that on, it's like, ooh, ooh. It was it always got like a response. So, you know, electronically, once I got it in my mind that any anything was fucking at bay. It's a sample. <laughs> yeah. Electronically, it was over. Okay. And, you know, people wasn't even there yet. And see what was dope about Marley, you think about it, he used his, the skills of DJing, his, you know, his DJing air. That's the, you know, how to how to move those skills into producing. Because he has always told me, he was like, you know, we have an advantage, I think, like a DJ when I'm producing. So that was also a, an advantage that he had over some other producers in the hip hop. And plus it was so young and everything was so fresh. And everybody was so stuck on de- and scratching and going back and forth, spinning back and forth as fast as they could on two turntables. It was cute, but I I, I felt I want I didn't want to do that. I wanted to fucking I want to make music. I want to I want to be the person that creates what they're doing that on, you know uh, you know make DJ tools for you to scratch up and do all of that shit. Well, so make it dope. Well, one. It's funny you say that because one of the samples from In Control Volume 1, Keep Your Eyes on the Prize, where, they, where Premier had sampled uh, Master Ace, check the technique, see if you can follow it. Mm-hmm. I wanted to get from you, because that's not a song or a sample people talk about a lot, even though Gangstar, Step in the Arena is a phenomenal album. So for mm-hmm. you, as someone that made beats, went in sampling, when you started hearing your stuff being sampled by other producers, what did that feel and how did that change or inspire or influence you? I mean, you know, that that became the tree. That became my tree. You know, once I stopped producing myself and start hearing, check it out, y'all, and shit and people's beats and little scratches and stuff like that. I mean, that's where the tree starts growing. So I look at it as a tree. You know, look what happened. Look what the tree grew. The tree grew a lot of good talent, a lot of great Branch music. Yeah, branches. It, it branched out, you know, and shit, we did a lot of innovations still to this day. Absolutely. So, and, yeah. and, and as a producer, uh, Shan had told me this, that you didn't want to initially record Rakim. So as you grew as a producer, how did you evolve to say yes to say no to want to do something to not want to do something when an artist would bring something to the table like a rock him or a different artist i you know, i was always one on energy i always went on the energy you know the energy was right in the, in the lab and we making some shit and it's like popping you know like, yeah oh yeah i'm, I'm st- i get still you know that's that i get stimulated by like like a hot 16 <laughs> you know what i'm saying i'm like oh you, you get what i'm like damn that's that's like stimulation it's almost like it's almost better than like smoking weed or drinking or getting high if i could hear a hot 16 going in my microphone and i know that shit is hot because i heard a lot of rappers (laughs) (laughs) and you know a lot of rappers didn't excite me at first you know in which rock rock king was one of them because i was already fucking with king going faster I was already fucking with G-Rap on the side. You, you get what I'm saying? So when we started working with Rakim, first thing we made was my melody was, was, was you know, it was like slow. extra slow. And I was like, yo, Shan, man, record this dude. I'm going to be in this room. Well, oh, that's why Shan gets the credit. Right, because mi- yes, oh, okay. Shan, I, I taught Shan how to um, punch and record. And he was like, okay, I got it. I said, record him. And then, you know, I think, you know, Shan recorded the vocals on my melody, I believe. Yeah, and he, uh, I think he gets credit for mixing on there too. Um, yeah, you know what he did? He's the one that made the copy of what they did that day. Okay. That's why, I, you know, when we made that record, I didn't, I didn't think it was finished. I was like, okay, I know, you know, I know today was a long day with these goddamn vocals. We're gonna come back and mix this shit. 
<laughs> and, That's tomorrow, what I mean. and tomorrow never came, huh? <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> right, and your right. man Eric, he, you know, he walked with you. He, he, Sham made him a copy of what we made that day. I don't know if it was on real or cassette, but the, the record wasn't mixed. It was like stuff popping up all over the place. At the end of the record, the cuts was like, you know, to be honest, the, 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 the most classical record in hip hop with the sloppiest cuts in hip hop has to be Eric B's president because we didn't finish the record. But yeah. sloppiness of it makes it what it is. Well, it's one of those perfect imperfections, as they say. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's like, if you really sit back and listen, the, that has the most sloppiest cuts in hip hop. Well, it's definitely not the uh, premier level of scratching that I've ever heard. That's for sure. Well, right. Because <laughs> I, I really thought that we was putting pieces down and going to come back later and fix these pieces. All right, this, these cuts you put right here, are we going to do the real ones tomorrow? Huh? <laughs> We're going to do the real ones tomorrow, and it's going to be, all oh, right, I get it. You're putting the ideas down now because we had such a long day with the vocals. Okay. Then, bang, next, next thing you know, I'm listening to the radio. I'm like, what the fuck is that? Yeah. I said, yo, Shan, you gave him a copy that day? He's like, yeah. I was like, oh, that's the fucking record. Mm. Hmm. Now, speaking of uh, confusion or different things, I, uh, I always was trying to figure out the how it worked on the business side and for you as a producer with the Prism Cold Chillin' relationship. Mm. And uh, I read... Uh, going off the story of Cold Chillin book, which I think was great, but I wanted to get from you, as Prism and Cold Chillin were emerging, how was that working for you and what was it like for you, if any difference? Mm, when it was Prism, I could say like this, I was making $65,000 a year. And then when it went to Cold Chillin, I made, made $200,000 a year. That's a big difference. <laughs> but, I had made four albums that year for 200,000. So that's a, that, that wasn't good. You get what I'm saying? Right. The math didn't work out to me. That's right, because you, you were single-handedly producing the whole right. albums. I was doing a whole album. I was the staff producer, so everything coming through, they was coming to me. All right, so I made four albums one year for only $200,000. And that would have been... Uh, going off, long live the cane, in control, volume one, and then even though it came out later, I guess Road to the Riches. Um, it, yeah, I think it was G Rat. Yeah, yeah, it was it was it was Biz Kane. I pioneered this. Shan and somebody and somebody else. I, you know, it was Shante, like a G Rap or somebody. I made like four albums in one year. Okay, and it, and it didn't to me. It didn't really pan out. I was like, yeah, hold up, man. I just did four fucking albums, man. If I do an album on my own, the budget's going to be like 250, 300, 350. You get what I'm saying? Right. So I'm like, yo, man, I'm out. And I just, I I, I, I literally Dr. Dre and just like, yo, y'all could keep all that shit. I'm out. And bro. Okay. So, well. <laughs> As far as the uh, the music itself, uh, one thing I was interested with dropping science is that on there, <clears throat> Craig G rapped about Cold Chillin' Warner Brothers, but then later he was on Atlantic. He never put out an album on Cold Chillin'. So why, why did that end up happening that way? Because I realized that if, if he even would have went to Cold Chillin', it's too crowded. If Tragedy would have went to Cold Chillin', they already had their stars. I really, you know, I know how the business goes. You got to be your own star where the fuck you go. You can't be like, you have, they have a superstar, three three or four superstars in front of you. Right. It's like, come on, bro. It's like, you just, who you fooling? <laughs> okay. So I was like, yo, your dudes would be better getting your own deals, you know? And it was better for them, you know? Everybody, you know, every, it was better for them to get, get their own deals, not dealing with, Cold chilling. Gotcha. It was better for the money wise. They made more money. You get what I'm saying? It, it was just better for them. They wouldn't have made that amount nice of money fucking roster. with, yeah, on a big roster. They was like their own stars where they went. 
Tragedy was a star. He was his own star at AM. You yeah. know, he didn't have nothing like him over there. You get what I'm saying? Um, Craig G was his own star at Atlantic because they didn't have nobody like him. And with the Kingpin album that you guys did, the first album on Atlantic, um, I was very intrigued that it had so much house on there. So what, what, how and why did that end up happening that way? I think I had a house music show and we made a record called Call Us, Make This House Into a Home, yeah. some shit like that. And it was like real popular in New York. And they was like, yo, go with that theme. You know, I was like, yo, I was kind of amped up because it was getting a lot of attention. But then by the time, you know, the politics of, of, of record companies, by the time his album came out with that on it, it was like a year later, it was like way too, way too late. Gotcha. The whole house thing, the whole house. Yeah. Rap, um, house. Hip house was like out. It was gone already and shit. Yeah, I know they Atlantic was trying to make it happen because remember they had Doug Lazy too. So they were they were trying to make it happen. Right. But, you know, for some reason, I think the, the the genre left them real quick. It just it just left them. Yes. Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that, five on your TV back Yo MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. There's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.